Matthew chapter 4. Did I ask you guys to turn there already? Awesome. If you, if you haven't, would you please do that? And if you don't have a Bible that you brought with you, I want to invite you to go ahead and, and grab one that they're sitting around. Ben, it's okay. You can just doze off. Um, kind of just be amongst yourself over there. That's fine. But Matthew chapter 4, you guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to continue in this series of being fishers of men. And, and I think this is a very cool series because I think this is at the heart of our faith, um, is reaching out to other people, considering others before ourselves. I mean, it, you, you read in Philippians, I think it's chapter 2, where, where Paul is talking about having the attitude of Christ. It's all about thinking about other people. As you read through even the Gospels, you, you, you read through and you see... Um, you see Jesus continuously ministering to other people. And even with the disciples, he's, he sends them out. Jesus doesn't rally this group around him, create this little church, and then just sit there and do nothing. Right from the beginning, Jesus is encouraging them, he's training them, he's building them up so that he can send them out. And it, even as we've talked about in Matthew chapter 4, where we're going to revisit again today, he calls them, hey, come follow me. And already, even in that first conversation, Jesus is saying, come follow me so that I can send you out, so that I can teach you, so that I can train you to be fishers of men, so that you can go out. It's at the heart of our faith to be evangelical. Denise brought up the fact that yesterday we were here, we had a membership class, and it's very, very exciting to, um, to have people coming on board wanting to be members of Maranatha. It's a very, very cool thing. And, and part of sitting through that class, because I, Denise and I actually sat through most of it with them, um, I did my very best to pay attention. Yeah, Jenny was in the class. Um, it, it's just a fun, it's a fun place to be. But one of the things that we brought up was um, just the idea of Maranatha's mindset. Our mindset, our philosophy is that we, we want to draw people to Jesus. We want people to know who he is. We want people to understand um, salvation and, and the freedom that we have in that. Matthew 28, 19, the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations. And that, that command, that doesn't always mean go overseas. It doesn't always mean there has to be an ocean or a third world country. And that's what I want to encourage you with today. To be fishers of men in your little pond in your circle, in your world of influence, whatever it is, to understand, in a sense, that's your mission field. When you have that great commission at your heart of your faith of being a Christian, it, it's your circle, it's the Via Maris, the main street of life is where we are to, to minister, it's where we are to reach out to people. And so even as we continue these next couple, two, three weeks going through this series, I want to encourage you to be thinking of the people in your circles. Kelly, you have coworkers that need Jesus. <laughs> For those of you that don't know Kelly, she, she pretty much runs Maranatha. Um, she's the receptionist at the Forest Lake campus, but that is such a uh, small part of what she does. And so when I, when I tease, that's what I'm talking about. But um, you guys, in seriousness, we all have family members. We all have coworkers. People in our community that you see. Maybe you see them at the bar when you go for a beer. Maybe you see them at the restaurant when you go out to eat. We are always given an opportunity to be fishers. Amen? The, the question that, that naturally comes up is, are we drawing people to Jesus? Or are we pushing people away? Last week, I think Tasha did a great job uh, sharing her message in this series about, about surrendering. And if you weren't here, or even if you were here and you didn't write these down, um, Tasha had three great points about surrendering and, and what happens when we surrender and, and just three things about surrendering. And I want to encourage you to write these down if you didn't last week. Grab your phone and punch it in. Ben, punch it in your phone. Or if not, punch it in your sister's phone. But have these three points because, you guys, this is a, it's a great encouragement. Um, you're, it's been, Ben, how long has it been since you were here? Probably since the last Sunday when I did this to you, wasn't it? I, that just clicked in my mind. I probably won't pick on you the rest of the service today now. <laughs> but it really comes down to surrendering, and it fixes this scripture of Matthew chapter 4, this idea of surrendering to Jesus, because Jesus begins by, by, by saying something to the disciples. The Bible says he's walking along the Sea of Galilee. He's just going about his daily life, 
And the disciples are just going about their daily life. They're just out working. And Jesus sees them out there and he says, Hey, come and follow me. And the disciples have a decision make at that very moment. And I love what the Bible says they did. The Bible says that Peter and Andrew, they're the first ones that he saw, that Peter and Andrew immediately left what they were doing and went to follow Jesus. They had a decision to make. Their decision right at that point is, yep, I'm going to surrender because I'm going to leave this and I'm going to follow you. And then it says in just a little while later, he's going down and there's James and John. And it says at once they left and they followed him. Surrendering, in a sense, their, their idea. They're leaving what they're doing and they're going to follow Jesus. And Tasha had these three points. See, I, I babbled for a little bit to give you a little bit of time, Ben. See, I can't do it. I'm not going to be able to leave you alone. So I guess we'll just surrender to the fact that we'll see you in a couple months. I don't know. <laughs> but um, his, these three points about surrendering that Tasha had. The first is this. You guys, it's a lifestyle. She emphasized to us that surrendering is a lifestyle. It's not something that you do willy-nilly. It's not something that you do just on Sunday morning. It's that, that's not it. Um, I think three or four weeks ago, you went up and got saved, right? When I had an altar call, you, you walked up front. That's the initial step of surrendering, but, but surrendering to Jesus is a lifestyle, so that was step one. But every day since then, it's surrendering. When you have your struggles with your addiction, when you have your struggles with the guys in your unit, you surrender to Jesus and you say, God, what do I do here? It's a continuous journey of surrendering our life. It's a lifestyle. It permeates who we are. That was her first point. It's a lifestyle. The second thing Tasha talked about last week was that it's a process. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight like this, and that's, that's what some of us want. The world that we live in, I'm telling you what, we want everything and we want it right now. I go out of my mind when I'm at home and I'm online doing something and my internet like pauses for a second. I don't know why it happens. I, I, for the life of me, I can't figure out the digital age we live in I live, it's right in town. It's not like I'm out in the country. But all of a sudden my internet has this little dead spot and it just drives me crazy because whatever I'm doing, I want it right now. And that's the world we live in. And you guys, the reality is, is when we give our lives to the Lord, we expect that same thing. We expect it's going to be an overnight transformation and everything, Ron, that you struggle with today, you're not going to struggle with tomorrow. And Sharon, as much as you would like that to happen to Ron... It's, it's not going to happen that way. It's a process, amen? It's a process, but you guys, oftentimes what we do is we throw in the towel because we think, God, I'm just a failure. I'm just screwing this whole surrender thing up because once again, I lost my temper with my coworkers. Once again, I said something I shouldn't have said to my spouse. Once again, I got frustrated with my kids. And so then what we do is we say, you know what, it's just not working for me. God must not love me enough. It's so important to remember this, this idea of surrendering. It's a process. Amen? And finally, the third thing that Tasha talked about last Sunday, having to do with surrendering our lives, is that when we surrender, it breeds the character of God in us. And that's a good thing. More and more, you start seeing who God is coming out of us. Is that right, Joe? More and more as we continue to grow, more and more as we allow our lifestyle, as we accept that it's a process, we see in our surrendering, we see the character of God coming out in us. And you guys, all of that having to do with being fishers of men, because it's, it's the kindness, it's the character of God in us that draws others to Jesus. And isn't that what it means to be a fisher of men, Ben? It is. It's absolutely what it means because the Bible says that it's God's kindness that leads us, Jenny, to repentance. It's not his wrath. It's not his anger. It's not he, all of his laws. It's God's kindness that leads us to this place of repentance. What's your name? David. So David, when, when others see that piece of who God is in us, they can't help but want to see it. When they see the fruits of the spirits in us, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we exhibit those things in our lives, we can't help but draw people to us. And as a Christian, isn't that what I ought to be doing? 
Ron, ought I not be trying to bring somebody to know this Savior that I have? To know this freedom that I've experienced? To know this, this shameless, guiltless life now that I can walk? Does that stir in you? Does that, that stir for some? Does it even make you emotional? Yesterday we were in this membership class and Pastor Carol Morley from the Forest Lake campus was our teacher. And it was so moving, wasn't it Jenny? It was so moving when Pastor Carol talked about her husband's salvation like probably 30, 40, 50 years ago. Do you know how long it was that Pat? I don't either, but it's been a long time. And as she talked about her husband's salvation, she was moved to tears. That's amazing to me because it should stir up inside of every one of us as Christians for somebody to know Jesus. Amen? That's what it means to be fishers of men, to have a passion to reach others for Jesus. And you guys, I'm telling you, the more that stirs in us as a church, the more we are going to have opportunities to minister to people. The more we're going to have those come in that they see something in you as your surrender breeds the character of God that makes them want to know who this guy is. I ask you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. And today I want to continue with this mindset of, of being fishers of men. And, and I really just kind of have two, two main points. And then we're going to have a time of worship. But these two main points come right out of this Matthew chapter 4. And, and it goes right along with tying in with Tasha, Tasha's message last week about having to, to surrender our lives. Um, the first point is this. Let's read this. Matthew chapter 4, starting in verse uh, 18. Phil, can you turn the lights up for me, please? Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Thank you. Uh, it says this. Thanks. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once, they left their nets and they followed him. They gave up what they were doing and, and decided they were going to do what Jesus had to do. And, and here's the thing that sticks out to me. These guys are fishermen. They're in the boat. They catch fish. They throw nets over and they do all of this hard work. And, and in my mind, I'm picturing they're mean and they're gruff and they don't have really good communication skills and they're swearing at each other. And, and, and this is just, this is them. They're just men. This is the life they're living. And Jesus, this rabbi, this Jewish guy comes along and he says, hey, come and follow me. And what is that like in their mind? That here's this guy saying, come and follow me. And they're thinking, what, this is all I'm ever going to be is a fisherman. What does he mean? And they choose at that moment, being the mess that they are, to say, yeah, I'll, I'll go. And they make that decision to leave it and follow him right there. Verse 21, going on, on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their net. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. You guys, there's, there's this idea of choosing to be a disciple, choosing to say, I'm going to surrender, I'm going to follow Jesus. And being a disciple, I want to I touch on this real briefly. This is my first point. Being a disciple, what does it mean to be a disciple? It means that you literally want to mold your life after whoever it is you're following. Right, Ron? It means that you want to be like Ben. If I'm going to say I'm going to surrender my life and I'm going to follow Ben, Ben, you're going to be my rabbi, you're going to be my teacher, that means that, how old are you, Ben? You're 19. Do you have a girlfriend? Good. Because the rest of this conversation was going to go a certain direction if you were going to say yes. Here's what this means. It means that when Ben goes to school, where are you going to school, Ben? You're going to St. Michael. Very nice. Where is St. Michael? That's all. It's in Minnesota, okay. The reason I ask that question is because being a disciple, if I'm going to be a follower of Ben, that means that when Ben goes to school, I'm going to school with Ben. 
It means that if Ben goes out on a date, I'm going out on a date with Ben. It means that when Ben is with his sister and his mom and his dad, I'm going to be with Ben because the idea being this, in all seriousness, it means I'm going to learn how Ben is Ben in life. It doesn't mean I'm going to learn how he's, he's Ben on Sunday mornings. And you guys, that's the idea that far too many of us have of being a disciple of Jesus, is it's on Sunday mornings. This is what it means to follow somebody. It means I'm going to mold my life after you. David? Nice. That's what it means. And if, if all of us guys say we're going to follow Ben, it, it means literally, it's like we're little ducks following Ben around to see what does Ben do? How does Ben treat his sister? How does Ben treat his mom? Why did you roll your eyes at that one? Wow. Ben, I have office hours during the week. You should call me. But that's what it means. Do you guys understand the principle of what I'm saying about being a disciple? It means I want to mold my life after Ben. How does Ben react to a new guy he meets in church? How does Ben react to older people, to younger people. And you, and you guys, this is what Jesus is saying, and this is, this is my whole point here. This is what Jesus is saying when he is telling these guys, hey, come follow me. This is no small decision that these guys make when they say, yes, I'm going to get out of the boat, I'm going to fold up my net, I'm going to put it in my tackle box, and I'm going to follow Jesus. Because what they're saying is I am going to follow Jesus. I am going to mold my life after Jesus. I'm going to watch him with his mom. I'm going to watch him with his brothers. I'm going to watch him with strangers on the street. I'm going to watch his relationship with God. I am going to watch him. This is the commitment they're making. They're saying, here's who I'm going to become. That's what it means to be a disciple. And Jesus is saying, David, follow me so that I can send you to them. Be my disciple Mold your life after mine so that I can send you to them. Right from the get-go, that's the message. Being a disciple, choosing to do it and, and, and follow Jesus to that extent. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. You see, sometimes, I don't know about you, um, I see some of the guys in the room, and I'm guessing this is true for most of us. Um, I'm not like this. But some of you, I know, you always think you have a better way of doing things. Right? You're, you're listening to somebody teach or speak, or you're watching somebody build something, or you're, you're doing something, and you're always sitting there, and you're thinking, boy, I wish I, was, I could do that so much better. <laughs> right? That's a lot of our, that's our mindset. And that mindset, whether it be, Building something, cooking something. Maybe I should use that example, huh? You eat something and you realize, boy, I could have made that so much better. But we have that mindset. That mindset follows right over into our discipleship, into our, our wanting to serve and follow Jesus. Because many of us, especially as we think of being fishers of men, we have this idea that we have it all figured out and that we can do it better. And that's where we have to come back to this idea. No, I'm a disciple of Jesus. As good as I can think I do something, I'm going to do it His way. Because His way is always better. Amen? You guys with me? <laughs> Two of you. That's not bad. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Another account of the, of the same situation taking place, the calling of these first disciples. One day, as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the Sea of Galilee, with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats, uh, two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, that's Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and he taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water, and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard. I want you to listen to this now. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night, and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. 
And they came and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Uh, and I want to stop right there because here's the idea. Again, you guys, being a disciple of Jesus means I'm going to model my life after him. I am going to follow him. No matter how good of an idea I have, even no matter how many times I've already done what I think he's telling me to do, I'm going to follow him. I am going to surrender to him and, and his leading. Because here you have these disciples. They go out, they're fishing. They've already been fishing all night long, and they haven't caught anything. Now Jesus comes along and says, Here, I, I want you to do this. I just want you to do it one more time. But we're going to tweak it just a little bit. We're going to put the net on the other side of the boat. And when we do this, when we follow Jesus, you see such an abundance that you never imagined possible. Being a disciple of Jesus, surrendering to Jesus, means I'm okay not doing it my way. Being a fisher of men and listening to what the rabbi has for me. Even if he says, Mary, I want you to do it again. I want you to try it one more time. Maggie, I want you to do it again. I know you're tired. I know you've been working all night long already. But I want you to do it again. That coworker of yours who's already told you they don't want to go to church with you, I want you to ask him again. That family member who you think wants nothing to do with you, I want you to pick up the phone. I want you to send a Facebook message. I want you to reach out to them. Yep, I know they've already said no a couple times. I get it. But, but this time I'm with you. This time everything is different because it's my plan and not yours. Everything changes when we make that decision to follow Jesus. When we fully surrender our lifestyle, when we understand it's a process as the, as the character of God as that, that is growing out of us, everything changes. All of a sudden, where we once thought there were no fish, there's a harvest, amen? That's the first point. Just the idea of being a disciple. The second is this. Um, I'll go back to Matthew chapter 4. You guys are funny today. Matthew chapter 4. Uh, I want to reread a part of this. We're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to close with a time of worship. Um, and by the way, get your, get your voices ready, because I'm going to invite conversation coming up here, which is always an interesting thing in this church. Um, I want to emphasize a couple of things that, that the disciples did when Jesus called them. It says this in verse 18. I want to reread it. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. If you have your own Bible, I want you to underline the words at once. Verse 21, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. If you have your own Bibles, even if you don't have your own Bible, if you have one of ours but you don't have one with you, I want you to underline it and just make that your own Bible. You can, you can take it, have it as a gift. But I want you to underline, and immediately. So I want you to underline at once and immediately. Because that's what this second point is, is what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for to be fishers of men? And, and the engaging part of this is, is I have an idea of some of the things we're waiting for, and I want you to think, as I babble for a couple of minutes, I want you to think, what keeps you from talking to somebody about your faith? What keeps you from inviting somebody to church? Or men, what keeps you from inviting your friend to go to the men's conference? What is a hindrance that is inside of you that keeps you from being a fisher of men, that keeps you from doing what Jesus is asking you to do. And I want you to think about that while I talk for a couple more minutes. And Ben, I'm expecting something good, man, just so you know. You guys, here's the thing. I have two big fish hanging on my wall in my office, and I have a 10-point buck and an 8-point set of antlers in my, in my office. So I understand a little bit about fishing and hunting. And, and here's what I understand as I relate this to being a fisher of men is that if, if you want to really be successful at fishing, when I caught these, those two northerns that are in my office, um, the first one I caught, I was with my brother-in-law, and he said, that's a thousand cast fish. Do you all know what that means? 
That means you, you have to expect to cast a thousand times before you catch a fish that size. And I've heard a muskie, uh, like a 40 plus inch muskie, is a 10,000 cast fish. That's how many times you have to cast, and that's how much time you have to spend in the water to catch a fish that size. Now, what most of us want to do, and what, what I always wanted to do, is I wanted to go out, fish for two hours, catch a monster fish, and catch enough fish to fry up. Two hours. I wanted sunny weather. I wanted calm water. I want dry roasted peanuts, a couple sodas. That's all I want. That's the environment and the atmosphere I want to be a, a successful fisherman. It's the same with hunting. Um, I, I remember when I was 12, 13 years old, I started hunting with my dad up in Walker, Minnesota. And I remember walking out, and, and I, I was tough. I just want you to know this. I was tough. I was the biggest wuss you would ever imagine. My first year hunting, um, I was, we had this stand, and it was called a, the platform stand. I'm, dad, I don't remember this, but th we had this platform stand. And I was, you know, a little ways from my dad, but not that far, so it was safe and everything. Well, I... Because it's chilly, Bob, I brought a sleeping bag. <laughs> Doesn't everybody bring a sleeping bag out to their deer stand? I brought a sleeping bag, and I was out there. My boots were off because my feet were cold. And sometimes if your feet get cold, you take your boots off, and you wrap them in, in your little sleeping bag in your deer stand when you're supposed to be this, this kind of this badass deer hunting guy. You wrap them in your sleeping bag, and you're set, Right? Doesn't every guy hunt that way? So here's me, I'm in my deer stand, and I'm curled up, and I was tired. <laughs> and so I was napping, <laughs> you know. I wake up, and I hear this noise, and I look, and, and then I'm, I mean, it was kind of an interruption to my nap, but I still, I open my eyes, I look, and, and here's this big buck coming right, right up this hill at me. I'm using a single-shot 20-gauge. I'm nestled on the, the floor of this stand in my blankie with my boots off. <laughs> it's like... I don't know how I, I didn't kill this thing. I shot it, we tracked it, but we didn't find it. Um, the point of all this being is that we expect and we want the perfect setting. I want to shoot, I want to shoot a 14-point buck this year. My dad and I are going to do a lot of bow hunting this year. I want to shoot a trophy buck. I want my dad to shoot a deer with the bow. Really bad I do. We want venison. I want to be butchering deer. I mean, this is what I want to do. But I just, I'm busy and there's so many other things I want to do. So we've already been out once and we didn't see any. Now we've got to go again. What a pain. <laughs> do you understand where I'm going with this? That, that's our mindset. I want a trophy to hang. I want another deer to put in my office wall. But Bob, what I've got to understand is that I've got to put time in out there. I have to be willing to understand that it's going to get rainy. It might get chilly. But if I want to put a trophy on the wall, whether it's a fish or a deer or whatever it is, I have to understand the circumstances and the situation might not be ideal every single time I step out into the woods or get on the boat. But I still have to understand this is what it's going to take. And you guys, for so many of us, we're waiting to be a fisher of men. What's your name? Sean. Sean. Sean, we, we wait. You got David right behind you. I mean, look at the poor guy. You can tell he needs Jesus. Look at you just look at him. Mess. And so what we do is we wait for the perfect environment for, for Sean for you to talk to David and say, hey man, you, you gotta come to church. Look at yourself. Look in the mirror. You're a disaster. You gotta come to church. But we wait for all of the stars in the universe to line up because we want we just we just want that. Just like I want to go sit in the deer stand one day when it's 60 degrees and get a 14-point buck. But that's not how it works. And so I'm going to miss out on that buck. Just like how many of us were missing out on opportunities to minister to people because we think that all of these different circumstances need to be perfect. Maggie's getting married to Brent. And once they're married, eventually they're going to start thinking about a family. Well, the tendency for many of us, for in my life and many young couples I talk to is what we want to do is, when, are you going to have kids? Yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to save $4.2 million and we're going to have the house paid off and we're going to have six cars and they're all going to be paid for and, you know, we're going to have watched every episode of everything on Netflix possible so that that doesn't get in the way. That's the scenario that we paint is we want everything to line up perfectly before this happens, but it never works that way. 
You guys, it's the same way when we look at this call to be, to be fishers of men. We, we want the environment to be perfect. Well, Lord, I will. I'll talk to my coworker. Sean, you say, I'll talk to Dave, but man, once, I, once I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit or once I speak in tongues or once I have the whole book of John memorized or once I got the whole Proverbs thing down or, or once I'm a theologian, or we, we, we go through all of these things. Once I'm done dealing with my own stuff, I mean, we create an environment where it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen where all of the ducks are going to line up just right, Al, where you're going to be finally ready to talk to your coworker that you know just needs Jesus. Chad, it's never going to be just perfect to where you're going to feel the most confident and comfortable to reach out and talk to that person, that customer of yours maybe. It, it just doesn't work that way. But yet we allow that to dictate what we're going to do. The disciples, they didn't wait for the environment to be right. Here's this guy who's saying, come and follow me. And they're just like, okay. I'm going to do it. They put down what they're doing and they say, I'm going to do this. And so friends, the question is, what are we waiting for? There is a harvest of people that need to know the love of Jesus. There is a harvest of people that, that are so far away from the church because all they know is a God that hates them and wants to condemn them. They don't know the love of Jesus. They don't know about his grace and his mercy. They don't know that he accepts us right where we are and then does this amazing stuff in our hearts. All they know is the church doesn't want anything to do with me because I'm divorced. The church doesn't want anything to do with me because I'm an addict. The church doesn't want anything to do with me because my kids aren't perfect. And on and on and on. And there's a harvest of people that need to know who Jesus really is. Amen? So what are we waiting for? And now I say all of that, and it can make us all feel really bad, can't it? But there's a real part of this that I want to talk about real quickly before we worship the Lord. And I want you to be honest. And I actually want you to say it. What keeps you from talking to people about your faith? Or maybe not talking to people about your faith, but what keeps you from inviting somebody to church or to an event or to a Bible study or a small group or a gathering? What keeps you from doing that? And, and what I mean is, is it the shame of your own choices? Is, the, is it the guilt of your current mistakes? Is it because you don't think you're smart enough? But I want to hear it from you. Just a few of you. I, I, I'm always tempted to just say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start right here, and we're just going to go around the room. And, I'm, and, and I want you to relax. I'm not going to do that. But it, it, it always, I want to, because I think, I think what, what's important is that we think we're the only ones that feel this way. And I can guarantee you that you're not. I guarantee it. Because we all have our insecurities and we all have our struggles. And so I just want a few of you to be very bold, very honest. I'm not looking for another sermon. I'm just looking for you to just a few words in you, in your heart of hearts. What's your hindrance? What is it that keeps you from being comfortable to say, I'll go right now. Immediately, I will follow you and be a fisher of men. What keeps you from inviting somebody to church? And just raise your hand, and I'll call on you. But just be courageous. Yes, Maggie. Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection. Okay, so here's what I want to do. Is there anybody else that feels the fear of rejection keeps you from doing it? Yeah, yeah. Tell me your name again. Trenton. Trenton. An inability to act in the present moment with faith and patience. Awesome, well said. Very well said. Who else? Is anybody else feel that way? Like just right in the moment there to have the faith and to have the patience? Yeah. See, we're not alone. Who else? Who else? Very, I'm inviting interaction today. Usually when I don't want it, you guys are all talking and chatty. Yeah, Robert. Yeah. in the moment having the strength to just say something about your faith or about going to church. Yeah. Yeah? yeah? That's awesome. That's awesome. You know, the Bible says that um, in our weakness, he's made strong. And so acting in the moment and saying, God, I'm going to trust you right now. 
because this guy needs to know Jesus, and all I'm going to do is invite him to church, but I'm, this is scaring the hell out of me, but I'm going to do it. And in that moment, in our weakness, he is made strong. Is that right, Ron? Jenny? That you're not a good enough role model, that maybe they'll look to you to set the example for them. Yeah? Anybody else feel that way? Holy buckets, that's me all day long. Are you kidding me? Wow, the Apostle Paul in one of his letters, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. How many of us think, oh, don't follow me, but follow Christ? <laughs> Amen? But I want to tell you something. Paul wasn't perfect, right? Paul made mistakes. Paul was still sinful. Paul, in his own words, said, man, not that I have arrived, but I press on. Is that right, Ron? I press on. I press on. I press on. So, Jenny, it's okay. As a matter of fact, here's what I want to encourage you with. And it, and it always sounds funny, but do you guys like that I'm transparent and real? Is that not nice? So if you like that about me, a pastor that gets to stand up front and babble for today three hours, <laughs> do you not think that others would appreciate that in you? Right? Just because you're not up front preaching, that doesn't mean that people won't realize, Bob, and appreciate your genuineness for you to say, you know what, I love Jesus. But boy, do I struggle with this. But it doesn't mean I don't love him any less. And boom, there you go. It's just like the Apostle Paul. People like it, the fact that I'm just me. Do I love Jesus? Yep. Does he love me? Yep. Am I forgiven? Yep. But am I a screw-up? You have no idea. Right, Ron? There's two of you. I don't know which one I should be pointing at more here. <laughs> He's laughing and his face is really red. <laughs> you, you guys, do you understand what I'm saying here? Do you see this illustration? We're not alone. We're not alone. I don't know about you, but somebody invited me to church. And I, and I don't think they were perfect. They thought they were, but they weren't. Somebody invited me to church. And I want to challenge you guys with this. Invite somebody to church. Invite somebody to a small group. Invite somebody to the men's conference or to the women's retreat. Invite somebody out for dinner. I'll be honest, that's the hardest for me because it's like, oh, I'm just busy. I, I, think, I think about Bob every once in a while. It's like, I know he works in the area once in a while. Why, why haven't we had lunch yet? Why really haven't we had lunch yet? Do you have a problem with me or something? <laughs> I think about Al. Al's a, he's, I don't even know if Al works or not, because every time I see him, he's just screwing off. There's no reason we shouldn't have had lunch yet. But that's my struggle, because I'm task-oriented, and i got a job to do, and, and I forget. Relationship, man. Ben, you want to go out to lunch someday? <laughs> Ben's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Jack Wagon, I'll see you in two months. I'll buy, yeah. But do you guys understand? Man, there's, there's so much of this that it's like we're all in the same boat. We all are in the same boat. But what I want to encourage us with today is to be just like Peter and Andrew and just like James and John and to say, let's get out of our boat. Let's be willing to say immediately right now where I'm not even going to worry about the circumstances. It doesn't matter if it's snowing, if the wind is blowing. It doesn't matter if, it doesn't matter. I'm going to go sit in my deer stand because I want, I want that. It doesn't matter if it's a little wavy and it might drizzle. I'm going to get in the boat and I'm going to go cast 500 more times because I want the 10,000 cast fish. And friends, we have friends, we have family that need to know Jesus, and it's going to take maybe more than one little conversation. It might take a couple times. It might take a conversation at a time where it's not convenient, where it's not fun, where you just don't feel like it. But at once, they followed Jesus. I want to encourage you to pray this week for opportunities to invite someone to church.